This is the story of the development of our understanding of the world of chemistry, from the early days in ancient Greece to the modern view of atomic theory. Around 440 BC, Empedocles suggested that matter consisted of four elements, water, earth, air and fire. It seemed logical because when objects catch fire, moisture is released, air can be felt coming up from it, and the ashes show the earth that it contained. Classifying all matter as only being made of four elements certainly simplified our view of the world. Around 400 BC, another Greek philosopher, Democritus, also agreed there were four elements, but he proposed that there was a limit to how small an element could be divided. For example, if you look at a beach, it looks smooth from a distance, but up close we know it's made up of grains of sand. Democritus said that matter may look smooth and solid, but if we could see it very, very close, then we would see that it's made of pieces. He called these pieces atomos, which means indivisible. He said that the tiny particles were always moving and you could not cut them into smaller pieces. A substance's properties were due to the shape of the atoms. For example, liquids have round particles so they slip over each other and solids have cubes so that they can stack together easily. Around 340 BC, Aristotle introduced the fifth element which he called ether. He reasoned that fire, earth, air and water were earthly and could be changed, and since no changes had been perceived in the heavenly regions, the stars could not be made out of any of the four elements, but must be made of a different unchangeable heavenly substance, which he called ether. He didn't believe in the theory of atoms, because he said you'd be putting a restriction on the gods. If the gods wanted to divide an element into something smaller than an atom, they could. The concept that God or gods had unlimited power was quite popular and it kept people from accepting the idea of atoms as being something indivisible for about 2,000 years. However, in the late 16th and 17th centuries, one of Aristotle's ideas was revived. He had claimed that the fifth element, ether, could turn cheap metals into gold and cure disease and old age. This pursuit of the fifth element became known as alchemy, and many people experimented, without much success I might add, to turn lead and other base metals into gold. Often their tests led to poisonings and explosions and were pretty much unsuccessful. The first man to really apply science to the study of matter was Robert Boyle. He was born in Ireland in 1627 and wrote a book called The Skeptical Chemist, which urged chemists to abandon the view of the alchemists that elements were mystical substances. He criticised Aristotle's supernatural fifth element and alchemy, and instead he promoted a philosophy that valued observation and experimentation. The next step was made by an Englishman, Joseph Priestley, who was believed who believed from his experiments that a certain air, which he called phlogiston, which we now know as oxygen, was required for burning. Although he was a churchman, he became very unpopular for his liberal views and his support of the French and American revolutions, and when the mob burned his house and church down, he was forced to flee to the USA. The Frenchman Antoine Lavoisier was very impressed with Priestley's work and used it to help develop the theory of the conservation of mass, that is, that matter cannot be created or destroyed. He had a fairly checkered life as he married a 13-year-old girl because she was able to speak English and could translate the works of Priestley. However, he was executed by guillotine during the French Revolution, ostensibly for selling watered-down tobacco, but more likely because he was a tax collector and an aristocrat. Another Englishman, John Dalton, picked up on Democritus' idea and said that atoms looked like round billiard balls and that each element was made of only one type of atom. These are the actual wooden spheres that Dalton used as model f models for his atoms. They're about 200 years old. Notice the holes drilled in them. I imagine he used them to connect one to another to make compounds. His models were actually very similar to the ones we buy now to model atoms. Yes, 200 years of technological advancements and our models are not much better. Dalton said that each atom had a unique weight and cannot be created or destroyed. These atoms combine together in simple whole number ratios to form new substances, for example carbon dioxide or in this case ethanoic acid. He tested this by weighing out samples and finding that if he used the right proportions all the reactants were used up, but if he used too much of one then there was some left over. This seems obvious to us, but in those days it was not very clear at all. One of his other achievements was to set up an early version of symbols for the elements. However, it was a little too artistic and we don't use it now. 
At the same time as all the experimentation was going on, people were trying to find some patterns amongst the elements in order to understand how they worked to f together to form compounds. In the early 1800s, John Spezelius began a systematic study of the known elements. He measured atomic masses and devised a set of symbols as shortcut representations of the elements. At the same time, Johann Doberiner grouped sets of three elements with similar properties together, where the middle one had properties halfway between the other two. This became known as the triad theory. Englishman John Newlands follow up, followed up on this idea but arranged elements into eight groups with similar properties and his theory became known as the octaves theory. In 1867 a Russian Dmitry Mendeleev constructed what he called a periodic table. He arranged elements according to atomic mass with vertical groups based on similar chemical properties. He even left gaps for undiscovered elements in his table. The table looked a little bit like this and you'll notice that all of this was done with no knowledge of the internal working of the atom. Obviously more work was needed. Name is Thompson. Been working in Cambridge for a few years now in the physics department on cathode rays. Been having a devil of an argument with some chaps in Germany. They think cathode rays are electromagnetic radiation of some kind. I believe they are some sort of particles been reading the work of young Dalton on atoms and I believe he has some good ideas but I don't believe that atoms are indivisible like he says. I conducted this experiment where I made up a hollow tube with a metal filament and evacuated nearly all the air and when I passed an electric current through it glowed green and a beam of rays which I called cathode rays was emitted from the filament. I found that if this beam was passed through an electric field, it was actually deflected. The beam bends towards the positive plate. If I reverse the plates, then the same thing happens. The beam bends towards the positive plate. So I believe that the cathode rays must have a negative charge and they must have come from the atoms in the filament. So, in my model, I think of the atom as having smaller negatively charged particles called electrons, which are embedded into a sphere of positive charge, rather like the sultanas in a plum pudding. Been setting some of my students to work on this idea, particularly a young New Zealander called Rutherford. Rutherford set up an apparatus which bombarded helium nuclei at a detector. He placed a piece of gold foil in between the emitter and the detector and watched the effect on the alpha particles. Most of the particles passed straight through the foil, which led him to doubt that the charges were squashed into a solid ball of charge as Thompson had proposed. Not only that, occasionally alpha particles were reflected back towards the emitter, which could only happen if they were repelled by another positive charge. So the model he proposed for the atom said that most of the atom was empty space and that there was a nucleus in the centre of the atom and this contained a positive charge. The electrons orbited randomly around the nucleus.